Hello, and welcome to the Tex Mix podcast brought to you by the Texas Signal. My name is Jessica Montoya Coggins, and I am joined today by a very special guest by the name of Kevin C. O'Leary. Hi, Jessica. Nice to be with you. Yes, uh, not to be confused with uh, that Shark Tank person who uh, is kind of unsavory. So this is by, I, we were just joking, this is the superior Kevin, Kevin O'Leary, Kevin C. O'Leary. <laughs> Um, so Kevin is a fellow at the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of California, Irvine, and he also is a te he teaches at the Political Science Department at Chapman University, and he is a contributor to the American Prospect. Uh, but the reason that we're here today is Kevin has written a wonderful book, one that I heartily recommend called Madison Sorrow. Um, so first off, congratulations. I uh, really enjoyed it. And um, as you're making the rounds, how, how does it feel to, to sort of promote the book? Um, it's good. I mean, it's really good. The subtitle kind of tells what it's about. It's um, called um, Today's War on the Founders and America's Liberal Ideal, because what's happened with the right and with the GOP is for a long time they were attacking the New Deal state and things like that. But what's happened in the last couple of years is it's accelerated and they're attacking the foundations of the country. You know, when people are semi-loyal or disloyal to what the flag and the Pledge of Allegiance and the Constitution represent and mean, um, that's really disturbing. Um, and so we're in a situation that's highly unusual. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I guess we'll sort of dive right in. Could you talk a, a lot of this book, you talk about a liberalism and from the outset, you are talking about an illiberal mutiny that we're in the midst of. Could you sort of elaborate on that and let us know what that means? So uh, traditionally American politics has been fortunate in that we've had liberals and conservatives arguing about public policy across the decades and they fight like cats and dogs. Underneath that, there was a loyalty to the founding principles of the country. Uh, other countries didn't have this. So many countries have a real left, meaning a Marxist-Leninist left that's communist and doesn't like democracy a bit. You know, it's kind of Marxist-Leninism, if you will. And many countries have really strong reactionary politics, and sometimes it falls into fascism with violence. And we've been blessed. We haven't had that. Uh, there's been there's been tinges of authoritarianism in the old South, and I'll talk about that. But we haven't had it as a national political thing, where what I call illiberals, like it's, it's almost like you had liberals and conservatives forever, and now the GOP. And that's my fascination with this book project. It was not so much about Trump. It's been my trying to understand why the Republican Party has continued to march to the right and just keeps going. And that in, in doing that, they've moved from the classic conservative positions of tradition and loyalty to a constitution and loyalty to the elections. You know, Liz Cheney today, she is a distinct minority. And a lot, most of the leadership and a good part of the base are in what I would call reactionary politics or illiberal. And that was a word that like um, people would use who are academics and journalists for places across the world, but not the US. It was always outside of the US when you talked about this because you were talking about authoritarian societies. And now that word is being used by you know, sophisticated journalists um, and people, and that's a real threat. And when you add the threat of violence to that, then you are getting into real fascism. So I was careful in this book. I didn't want to call people fascist. Most people in, in, you know, on the conservative side, many of them are still Reagan type conservatives or Bush W type conservatives. And they may not quite understand what's going on with the elites. And they say they, they don't like the base, but you know, where am I going to go vote kind of thing. So when I say a liberal mutiny, um, another way to talk about this is I think we are not, there's been some talk recently about, oh, the U.S. is almost like at a civil war point, right? We had our civil war. Is it brutal and awful? Um, but that's, that's kind of rhetorical excess. What we're really in is um, we're in the midst of a revolution from the right, 
We're in the midst of a reactionary revolution. And revolutions are a special thing because when a revolution takes over a party and starts taking over a country, then you get extremes that you don't see during normal politics. And if you look at the GOP and you could say this reactionary revolution kind of started, and I'll explain later how it did, but you know, Reagan and Nixon are at the start of it. And then when Gingrich takes over, that's, that's important, right? And he changes the whole language of how Congress is run and becomes very brutal and direct and derogatory and nasty and calls the, you know, the people on the other side of the aisle traitors, basically. And all kind, he had a list of, of names he would give to his subordinates, like, don't call them you know, anything but these nasty names to try to communicate to the public. You can't trust the Democrats. Democrats are, are terrible. Then you go to the Tea Party. Then you go to the rise of Trump and the whole Trump administration and what he did as president. And then you get to QAnon. So you, you, you have to see that as you go along, it's just gotten crazier and crazier. If you look back way back to the French Revolution, a guy like Marat, who was one of the radicals where Ropes Pierre and Danton, he was a nutcase. He was running this newspaper that was calling for people's heads to be chopped off all the time. Before the revolution, he's living in the sewer, literally, right? He's, 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 he, he was a scumbag personally, and he was down in the sewer himself. He had failed at everything he'd done. Um, but he was extremely good at revolutionary politics. So if you think today about somebody like Steve Bannon, right? Okay, he went to Harvard Business School, but his politics were so, and his business career was such, that you would not expect him to be an advisor to the president. Yeah, he would be one of these people on the right wing talking about his ideas. No, he's got real power. And that's unusual. When you get that kind of situation, then you are kind of in this reactionary revolution. And most of us just, just don't grasp what the hell's going on. Yeah, that's one of the things I really, it sort of opened my eyes in the book is, you know, for people to say like, oh, Trump is this big aberration. He came out of nowhere. How did we see this coming? And your book very much details actually there were these things that happened along the way, these people mm -hmm. that came to power, uh, these, these things that happened that led directly directly to, to Trump. And I think even the insurrection as, as yeah. well. So one person, so to go back into history, one person okay. that's mentioned a lot in the book is Alexis de Tocqueville. And I'm a little yes. embarrassed in doing research for this. I always thought his last name was possibly de Tocqueville, and I have now realized that I was completely wrong on that. Well, um, it's, you know, it's, it's the French, so it's, you know, we, we kind of shorten it to Tocqueville, but we're, you know, it's Alexis de Tocqueville, that's his name, and, and uh, yeah. Uh, so he's somebody that you, you mention a lot, and especially in his book, uh, uh, Democracy in America. So could you talk a little bit about him and yes. possibly yeah. what, what he would make of Oh, right, right. <laughs> Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, is like still the classic about American politics. He was this, he was one of the grand sociologists. He was this brilliant young guy who was an attorney, came to the U.S. supposedly to, to study the prisons, but he, he got a grant. He was from a family that lost everything in the French Revolution. He was aristocratic. And he was trying to understand why does democracy work in the U.S.? with just kind of, you know, they don't have the education of Europe or any of our institutions, but their way of doing democracy works a lot better than what we've done in France and other places in Europe, you know, 40 years after the French Revolution. And he came to the conclusion that it was our habits of the heart, so to speak, that it was our norms and mores and what we did, our practices, our kind of everyday practices. So he idealized the New England um, town meeting, right? And he idealized um, people on their farms in the Midwest, you know, Abe Lincoln's dad, right? And just kind of these small towns and they made it work and they had their own kind of organic democracy. And, you know, he talked about self-interest properly understood. He knew that people were self-interested, but he said in a really good democracy, you think about the common good as well. And you understand that you may sacrifice a little bit of yourself sometimes for the greater good, but it's gonna come back and help you. It's kind of like we're all neighbors, right? 
Now, in his book, he focuses a lot on the North and the West. He knows about the genocide against the Indians. He knows about what's happening to Black Americans in the South. Uh, he does not admire the South. And so, so in a way, my book is, is tracking the illiberal stuff that he sees, but he hasn't seen it develop, right? His book is, 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 you know, is, is a celebration of the positive parts of American political experience and, and how the things should be. But in, in a real way, we've been taken over by the illiberal stuff, especially right now. Um, um, so, so in a way, my book is, is kind of a study of the mores, the habits of the heart, the kind of, I'm tracking the ideology of the bad stuff in our political consciousness. Mm -hmm. right, and I can go on and explain that. <laughs> yes. Um, so one thing that I also thought was was very interesting, uh, you know, as you think of America and a democracy, and I know that many people, including Republican senators, will say, no, we are a republic. But, um, you know, a lot of the institutions that are set up here are not actually sort of that democratic. Uh, you go into the Senate. You, I know you talk about the Senate. I know you also talk about the Supreme Court. Um, you know, in a state like Texas, we're greatly impacted by both of those things. Um, we have upcoming Supreme Court cases that, you know, look to possibly uh, erode so many things, overturning Roe v. Wade, uh, more gun laws, possibly ending mm -hmm. affirmative action as we know it, they, all these sorts of things. So I was wondering if you could sort of speak on that and just the limits of a democracy, especially as it is set up in, in America. Yeah, um, and to that point, the reason we have some problems with American democracy is we were the first. There was the English Revolution, 1640, 1660, which, which was extremely important. The, the radicals, the, the, the liberals there were working toward free speech and elections and everybody should be treated equally. Um, they, they got their ideas heard, but they didn't become all the way the fabric of England. The parliamentary side won against the king, but the king comes back. In the US, when we found the country, we're kind of like, we're trying to recreate something and create something new because we look and we see that there's Athens and we see that there's the Roman Republic and there's elements of democracy in Florence. And there's this, these ideas coming from England and there's the Magna Carta and we wanna do something along that line. And we're inspired and the book talks about this by the philosopher John Locke. And he, he has a one key thing um, in his essay on human understanding about how we think. He, he is the, the most radical of all at the time by saying peasants can think basically as well as a king or the aristocracy. And Jefferson and Madison and people, they pick up on that. And so they craft the declaration, which announces, you know, we're gonna be, equality is gonna be central to how we, we idealize the country, our aspirations are that way. And we wanna have a country that's values liberty, equality and democracy all together. But when we set up the institutions it's, you have the declaration and you have the constitution, you know, from high school classes, we know that the constitution met right after Shays' rebellion up in Massachusetts. And the people that were, you know, running the constitutional convention were kind of the upper class of the time. And they set institutions in place that didn't trust democracy all the way. So we end up with the electoral college, right? because we don't want it. So, we, so think about the, our system. In the beginning, it's only the House of Representatives that's connected directly to the people. In Pennsylvania, they had a radical um, clause in their state constitution where they wanted people to actually read the law and think about it before the, the state legislature would finally pass on it. We didn't do anything like that in, in the constitution itself. And so the Senate, Madison, for example, wanted the Senate to be by uh, population. He did not want California with two senators while Wyoming had two senators, right? He wanted places like Texas and California to have 
many more senators than we've got now. So that was an, that was one key part that the, the kind of more conservative elements at the time were able to get a U.S. Senate by by just two people per state. Um, you know, and there's just different dimensions. Then you get they at the time the founders weren't sure what the Supreme Court would be. Um, Justice Marshall helps create the idea of judicial review. And then the court becomes the place where things are declared unconstitutional. Um, that element, right? If the court behaved as it does, um, uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who's now the dean at, at UC Berkeley Law School, has got a great book called The Case Against the Supreme Court. I recommend it highly because it will tell you we think about the Bill of Rights always applying to everybody. They only started applying to everybody in the 60s mm -hmm. because the meaning of states' rights was the states could override and say, we've got majority rule, isn't that democratic, but we can ignore minority rights. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this complicated thing going on. If the Supreme Court always did the right thing and in the sense of protecting minority rights and standing up for individuals and not corporations, things might be different, but you know, we've got the US politics we've got. It's kind of a complicated mix. We've got some very positive things, but we've got some things that hold us back as well. I've been thinking a lot about the things that hold us back, especially as a lot of these text messages are coming out about the insurrection and the ways in which mm -hmm. certain state legislatures, uh, places like Texas would just, uh, we did, I mean, we did actually vote for Trump, but you know, in states uh, like Arizona okay. or Pennsylvania, things like that. Right, and that goes back to Tocqueville's point that this really strong thread in him, and it's picked up by the, the, the Harvard authors of a book called uh, How Democracies Die. And it, it's the idea that norms underlie everything. And that, you know, you, you've had democracy, to, so to speak, in many Latin American countries over time, right? Mm -hmm. And they write the constitution and they have the laws. But if the mores, the norms of the society don't align with that, and the powerful interests in the society don't agree to that, it's not gonna last. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the most interesting chapters for me, especially as this book details sort of the war on the liberal idea is about FDR and mm -hmm. the what we consider like this great sort of progressive mm -hmm. time in America. And mm -hmm. yet you actually talk about the aftermath of that in 1938. I was really fascinated by this individual, Cotton Ed Smith, and, and uh. his thoughts. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, FDR and, and then what, what happened afterwards? Yeah, I mean, FDR wins this landslide like twice, tremendous victories. And, you know, he's the leader of the Democratic Party, but the old white South, the racist South is part of the Democratic Party too. What, what Roosevelt hopes is that he can drive a campaign among Southern voters to, to tell them you should join on wholeheartedly and we can raise your wages. <laughs> in the 1938 campaign, he's, he's, he's backing candidates, kind of like Trump's backing candidates now. Well, Roosevelt backed candidates then that were on the liberal side of the New Deal and they were challenging the Southern power structure. Well, the Southern power structure won. <laughs> Roosevelt basically said, you know, it takes a long time to change things. And that hooks into one of the basic themes of the book is if I have one hero in the book, in addition to like people like Tom Paine uh, and Jefferson, um, it's, it's Thaddeus Stevens coming out of the Civil War. And it's that we didn't win the Civil War like we needed to. It's like, you know, I was talking to you at the earlier part about it. we're in a reactionary revolution from the right. Well, you could think about our liberal selves as a long running liberal revolution that never gets violent, never becomes extreme. It's kind of like we start it and we kind of, and we know we're not there. And it's, it's, you know, the founders get criticized a lot because of slavery and everything else. On that point, it turns out Jefferson never gets over his racism, his personal racism. He knows it's terrible and does terrible things to the master family and kids, but he can't get past it personally. He's at his most radical in writing the Declaration. 
because there he has a paragraph that blames slavery on the kings. It's historically inaccurate, but rhetorically brilliant because we would have founded the country as being opposed to slavery. Well, the Southerners wouldn't let that happen. Right? The people from South Carolina would love to let that happen. Madison too. Madison is from a slave family. Um, his grandfather was killed by a slave, but Madison knew he did not want to create a country, a republic, with slavery in there. So you obviously have this stuff like two thirds, right? But, but there's new research showing and, and highlighting the fact that Madison worked really hard, kind of stealthily with George Washington and others, I believe, um, to make sure that the word slave, slavery, and property in man is not in the Constitution itself, right? There's clauses that speak to those things, but those words are not in there. That allowed the abolitionists and Lincoln to stand up right before the Civil War and say, you know, we can, as a national government, decide against slavery. This is a state issue. It's not in the Constitution. Okay, fast forward to the end of the Civil War. Thaddeus Stevens is there. And so our liberal revolution goes on, and now we're going to try to include people. We're going to try to bring the black slaves into the fold. Well, the mistake that's made that Thaddeus Stevens understood would be a mistake was to just give the freedmen freedom, right, and the vote. He knew that wasn't enough. He said, what we've got to do is take the property from the largest plantation owners, not the small fries, the largest, and give that property to poor whites and poor blacks. If we did that, we'd do two things at once. We take away the power, we, 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 we kneecap the power of the Southern aristocrats who were the oligarchs running this place. That's a small fraction of the Southern population. And we change the culture of the South by giving people an economic standing. That would make the South much more democratic and liberal and much more like the North and the West. We don't do that. So things go from you know, 1865, but especially from 1890 to 1965, those states in the South, including Texas, are authoritarian one-party dictatorships. There's a really famous book in political science by a guy named B.O. Key, who's a Texan, taught at Harvard, taught one of my professors, David Mayhew, and his book's called Southern Politics. He and his research associates went down to Texas and all these other states, state by state, and they didn't record conversation because that would upset people. They just sat down with people and had coffee or beer, and they, they just sat there and listened and said, tell us how it really works here. And then they scurried back to their hotel room afterwards and wrote down everything. Well, he found out that it was like a small oligarch in each in each state that was running things. And that, 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 that voter suppression in the 1900s and 1910s at that period, that was targeted not only at blacks, of course, but poor whites, because poor whites had been populous. They had united with Tom Watson back in the 1890s and almost took the power away from the bourbon class, so to speak, the plantation folks. Um, and they didn't want that to happen. So the, there was an echo of like, we didn't quite get there with, with you know, Thaddeus Stevens and we, we try with, with FDR to get there, but it's still, that, that piece is so strong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I just really loved, I mean, I, it was just an, an insightful that you had. Uh, so Cotton Ed Smith is from South Carolina uh -huh. And he basically says that, you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act is unnecessary, um, you know, because a man could support a family on 50 cents a day. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> and right. it, 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 it just reminded me, too, you know, in Texas, we're only one of 12 states that has an expanded Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's I mean, if we if they did, if, you know, our governor said, you know, we're going to do this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, Five million people would would be put on on Medicaid, and not only that, it would actually generate billions of dollars. And this is it's supported yeah. actually by you know the um, chambers of commerce from from different mm -hmm. cities, not exactly bastions of of yeah. liberalism. And so you, it it just is like it would make sense, but you don't do this. 
Yeah, and that just goes part of the argument of my book is is like a lot of people understand that that racism is at the root of the U.S. not having a more you know expanded welfare state, right? But um, and, and and so we echo what's happening in Texas echoes to Southern politics before. Um, so I'll, I'll say this, let me say, there's like two strands to this illiberal thing in our brains, right? The, the bad stuff. One is the Southern racism, which becomes racism for all of the US. And in the South, you, you it's not during that period of 1890 to 1965, it's not just that the South is racist, it's also that it's authoritarian. And there's this really interesting thing that's going on that re relates to kind of like the trans stuff that's happening in Florida right now with Disney. Mm -hmm. It's that there was a famous saying, and I quote it in the book, of, of a northerner coming down to the South and saying, how does politics work here? What about, what are the issues? You know, and, and the old judge says to him, son, there are no issues, <laughs> right? And by that he meant, if you think in terms of classic rhetoric, there's, there's ethos, which is like, how you introduce yourself and trust me. There's logos, which is your argument. And then there's pathos, your feelings, right? Well, Southern, classic Southern politics from, you know, all this time till in 1965 is about trust me and fear them, them being poor blacks, right? And in the middle, your logos, it didn't really exist. It was entertainment. You entertained the racism of the masses by making fun and belittling and attacking savagely black people, right? That's what you did. When, when, when Trump becomes president, the weird thing about him, and I wrote a, 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 one of part of chapter nine, I believe, is this, uh, I'd written an article for the American Prospect in 2016, right when Trump got the nomination. And it occurred to me that Trump, even though he was this New York, glitzy, glamorous, crazy billionaire, right? Who was all about, you know, um, the tabloids and everything in New York City, right? That, that in his politics, he was really like the deep South of the old days, even before George Wallace, when they did this kind of politics of attacking people for entertainment, right? And Adam Sewer has a great, article and book called Cruelty is the Point, mm. right? And in old Southern politics, people came and celebrated when people were getting lynched. I mean, it's horrifying, right? Mm -hmm. And so Trump making fun of a crippled reporter trying to talk to him or whatever, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like this mean-spirited entertainment. So with, um, with the South, we had that. And now I think the Republicans, as they've gotten more extreme, they don't even have a party platform. They are, they are looking for things that are not really issues. There are ways to attack their enemies. Now, in the old days, the enemies were in the South were poor blacks, right? If you, if you had taxes, right, what would happen? You'd educate people and maybe they would start thinking and challenging the powers. So like, you don't want schools, you don't want hospitals, just leave them be. And, and um and so the Republicans have kind of gone back to that now, this kind of entertainment instead of actually addressing issues. Yeah, we, we cover that a lot. I've been looking at a lot of candidate pages for Republicans running for state house, state senate, and you'll look at their issues and there's nothing about healthcare or the economy. It is uh -huh. exclusively you know, abortion, anti-critical race theory, anti-trans thing, it is, um, is frightening. Um, so you did bring up George Wallace, and this right. was somebody who I had kind of read about a little bit in the history books, but it just felt so, so far in the past that we were like done with this. And I, as I was reading this book, I realized like, oh no, absolutely not. Um, yeah. You, yeah. you talk about also how, you know, he has this very infamous speech about segregation after Ford v, uh, after the Brown v. Board of Education uh, court hearing. Um, but you also talk about his hatred of government and how that. Right. So what happens is there's like two strands, this is the liberal stuff. 
And the fortunate thing for us, why our politics haven't gone crazy before, is that the white Southerners with some racism, right? You know, they were in the Democratic Party. They were a strong force, like we talked about with 1938 and, and Roosevelt trying to transform the South. But they did not dominate the New Deal. They did not dominate Roosevelt. He had to deal with them. They were one of the players in the, Repo in the Democratic Party, but they didn't run the whole show. Similarly, the, the other bad strain in our consciousness that's not bought in to making America liberal and quality mattering and democracy is the Gilded Age tycoons and the thread that goes from them to people like the Koch family, right? And that's this libertarian argument which, you know, when you talk about libertarianism, often it comes up, it's kind of like, well, you know, smoke grass or ride a motorcycle without a helmet, right? It's just like personal freedom. But the libertarian stuff that matters is this anti-state ideology that goes way back to one of the first um, social Darwinists named Herbert Spencer, who hated Marx, and then runs through F.A. Hayek, who wrote a book called um, um, about serfdom, um, and then, um, and then to Ayn Rand and her famous novels. And in all those places there, they divide society into, but especially Spencer and Rand into kind of like the producers and then the hangers on the producers and the moochers and the people that don't really deserve anything. You could hear that in Romney's famous 47% speech. And often that's coded as if it's always, of course, poor blacks that they're targeting. Um, with, with Wallace, when he hates government, what this speech was, it was 1963. There's three really important speeches in 63. There is, of course, Martin Luther King, right? I have a dream. There's also President Kennedy. He's pushed by King and others and his own moral conscience to finally give a speech shortly before he is assassinated that where he says for the first time in like a hundred years by U.S. president that, that Racism is a moral issue for the country at large. This is not a regional problem of the South. This is something that affects all of us and we need to change our policies about this. We need to get past segregation. We need to get a civil rights bill passed, et cetera. Well, Johnson comes in and gets that done. The other great speech of 63 is George Wallace's speech when he takes the oath of office to become governor of Alabama. And he wants to be the leader of the South against the North, against the Kennedys, against King. He wants to represent the South. He's not the most racist guy. He's just like your average racist because he had lost an earlier governor's race to a guy who had literally run the NAACP out of the state and put them in financial jeopardy. And after that, Wallace famously said, I will not be inward again. I will not, you know, this is not going to happen again. In 63, he says, um, you know, segregation forever. That's the famous line that his speechwriter, who was a KKK guy that put in there and told George, this is gonna, this is gonna get us attention. But the speech itself, it's a pivot away from the old demagogues because he doesn't attack blacks the same way as was traditionally done. He has code words. He attacks Washington and big government he attacks bureaucrats who can't park their bicycles and all this stuff about power from Washington. And in doing that, the speech is really important because he, he, he puts the two together. He puts this illiberal anti-state, anti-government feeling that had been traditional in the South together with the racism. The irony here is that George Wallace himself as governor was a New Deal Democrat. He was building schools like crazy. And Johnson was saying, why don't you be a New Deal Democrat like you're doing and stop talking to people about the racism? But he wouldn't do it. Um, so let's think. I, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Oh, yes. Um, well, so we brought up uh, Newt Gingrich earlier on. And in the book, you definitely do detail how you know, his rise in the 90s definitely brought that same, 
hate, you know, hatred of, of bureaucrats, of, of government, of, of especially for Democrats. Um, so I'm curious if, you know, to talk about him, his impact, how that sort of goes to the Tea Party and this through line that we're, we're facing now. Yeah, I, this revolution, I'll, I'll start with, um, the book begins with a picture back to what connects with Wallace and then we'll go forward. Turns out when Barry Goldwater got the nomination, so way back in the 60s, he wins by one percentage in California against uh, Rockefeller of New York. And so the right wing of the party for the first time is going to have the nominee. He's from Arizona. He's a strict constitutionalist. He's not for the civil rights bills. But, you know, he's from Arizona. There's not a black population he can claim I'm not racist. But he is a libertarian. He wants to. He wants smaller government. He's on that side of the spectrum. He has a secret visitor the day before the convention starts. Turns out that George Wallace sends an emissary to meet with Mr. Goldwater on top of the Mark Hopkins Hotel. And we were able to get the actual photograph that life took of this meeting. So the guy in the black jacket um, is uh, shaking hands with with Goldwater and he brings a message. The message is that George Wallace wants to be the vice presidential candidate along with Barry Goldwater on the 1964 ticket. Okay, that can't happen because George Wallace was a Democrat. But that preposterous yet brilliant idea, um, sinister, foretold where the Republican party was gonna go. That if you think about the inner logic of Gingrich, of Reagan on, it's, it's, it's the Goldwater-Wallace ticket, those two things coming together. And it comes together and it takes a long time for it to, to get momentum. But the thing was, it's kind of like those two pieces coming together inside one political party, they could finally dominate, right? They weren't just players, they could dominate. And they slowly but surely drove the regular conservatives, the moderate forces out of leadership and out of the party, right? So we even last, last week, we had one of the Michigan uh, representatives that's been in the house a long time. He's been redistricted and he says, it's just not worth it. And he's one of these people that's normal, right? And Liz Cheney being thrown out of leadership. She's the poster child, right? John McCain being made fun of by the president. That's the former president. That's just insane. So the days of Reagan, who in his heart came from a liberal family, they weren't racist. He had black players from his high school team stay at his house when they couldn't stay at motels. He was in Hollywood. He was cosmopolitan. And he worked with the Democrats. He was pragmatic. But in his head, he'd read Hayek. Uh, and the road to serfdom. He hated communism and he knew how to use race. So he went after when he got the nomination, he went to Mississippi, made one speech in the place where the three people had been killed, the three civil rights workers had famously been killed. And he mentioned state rights, states rights. And so he sent a message to the entire South. He didn't have to bring that up again. It was clear that he was on, he's on quote, our side. Um, Accelerate to Gingrich. Gingrich is the first Southerner. It's kind of like the Southerners start to take over the leadership of the party. Tom DeLay from Texas is part of that, right? The hammer, right? He's the force. He's like the speaker. He's just the one person behind, but he's actually running the house um, and a bunch of people. Um, and so from Wallace through through Gingrich and Gingrich radicalizes the house with these attacks. And then this reactionary revolution stuff happens. So people that were with him, they eventually get outflanked, right? So there's a famous case of the majority leader um, being outflanked um, and losing in a primer. People start getting primary, mm -hmm. right? With the Tea Party. Oh, with Eric Cameron. Yeah, right. And, and one of the people that was in line to be the speaker gets, gets primary and he's out. Um, because he, he dealt with the Democrats a little bit. He hadn't changed his policy views, but he had to work with the Democrats to make the government work, right? 
and so you got these people primer because all of a sudden with re, with the way districts are drawn you've got so many districts that are bright red or bright blue people don't have to worry about a challenge from the middle is in the general election it's just a challenge from the the further extreme in their party uh, and the republicans have certainly seen this so 2010 kind of cleansed a lot of people in texas and other places some of the um, moderate Democrats who've been in office a long time, they finally lost. And the Republican Party shifted, at least at the House level, to being pretty, pretty strongly, you know, more than conservative toward illiberal. And then Trump comes along, right? And Trump all of a sudden outflanks people. He has so many people he's running against. He doesn't have to win the primaries by 40%. He can have a low number. And he ends up winning the nomination. And then what's shocking to people, right, is that everybody lines up behind him. They, they, they were against him. They knew he was bad news. They knew his personal character couldn't be trusted. Um, and they still support him. Now, you know, at Rise of the Tea Party, we certainly saw that in Texas. Um, you know, people, you know, know about Ted Cruz now, but people also forget our attorney general was not really supposed to be attorney general, Ken Paxton. There was a, a moderate sort of former, uh, I believe, state rep or state senator named Dan Branch. And this man was supposed to, he was very much like a country club type of Republican. He was in line and then mm -hmm. he was just not, 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 uh, not right wing enough on that. Yeah. Um, Somehow the moderates just lost power. I mean, all these races where they just didn't have the troops, they didn't have the votes. It was kind of really surprising that the middle, that that, that one, Blank, you know, a substantial part of the Republican Party just didn't show an up enough in primaries to vote. And also that the business class didn't seem to really care that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like the business. I mean, I think now, um, you know, one challenge for the country is will the business class or an element of the business class wake up to the threat? You know, usually the business class is so focused on short-term profits and everything, and it's hard for them to stand up. But, but privately, um, you know, people in the business class, small companies and large, need to start talking to each other and understand we're a real threat. One of the things I found out in doing this book, it's kind of like, you know, the deep, dark secret that's threatening, is when you look at other countries, and this is a little bit esoteric, but Stay with me. We've talked about the deep south and the plantation owners. In every country before industrialization, there was a landed elite, right? In our country, it was the southern plantation owners. In Latin America, it's the land of Funi. And, you know, in, 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 in France, you've got the aristocracy on the land. Well, how, what the fate of these people, what happened to them as you move toward democracy and, and industrialization and a modern economy. In England, they married into the commercial class. In France, they were eliminated by the French Revolution. In Latin America, they had power. They were never challenged and they worked with the business elite in the cities to block liberal reform. And only Chile was a democratic country for, for years and years. In Germany is the big fearful case. They're the Junkers, J-U-N-K-E-R-S. They were the Prussian landlords. They were never challenged. They were super powerful. And they hated the Weimar Republic. And they stabbed the Weimar Republic in the back to put Hitler in power. They may not have understood who Hitler was totally, but they hated democracy. So in the American case, we thought we'd dodge this bullet because the North were the capitalists, right? That was the Rockefellers and so forth and the South with the plantation owners, and they get beat, they get defeated in the Civil War. But that ideology, because we didn't do what Thaddeus Stevens said, we didn't break up the plantations, that ideology lives and it is powerful in our culture to this day. And, the, and then it links up with the right wing of the business class and voila, we've got a problem. In France, right, we had a threat from the right, but what happens? Macron won by 10 points, right? Whereas in the US, we've had a right wing, a far right president. Trump is a far right president. Mm -hmm. You know, France didn't, it didn't happen, yeah. you know, in part because of this historical difference. Yeah, uh, Macron, he, 
you know, I, it's kind of bugged me a little bit. I see a lot of headlines like he eked out a victory. And I'm like, that is a larger margin that he had than Greg Abbott had. <laughs> yeah, in- it's, <laughs> it's major. It's major. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it well, wasn't small. One other fear that I do have from the book, too, is uh, there you also have a talk about a lot of the, the journalists, uh, people like Ida Tarbell. And one thing that does scare me a little bit uh, with the media, and we've kind of been seeing this with certain uh, certain sort of books that have been released about the insurrection and mm-hmm. things that sort of were withheld at the time and then get reported, you know, solely for- Oh, uh-huh, to like make that. one out of the book, yeah. Right, um, so I, I, that's also to say, if you are gonna get a book, please do get Madison Sorrow. You can, you can ignore <laughs> the access journalists on that. Right, it's different. It's a different book than like, a lot of the books that have gotten attention have been by Washington journalists, right? And they're, they're in the 24 seven loop and they're looking for the latest thing and they get, they get nuggets and they save it for their book but they don't have the perspective. They don't kind of pull back and see the whole thing. And my criticism of journalists today, um, many of them and and editors, you know, is is that they're, they're so focused on the 24 seven cycle that they're they're, They can see the leaves, you know, they trees are even hard, but they need to pull back occasionally and see the greater picture to see the forest. I was watching meet the press this weekend. And they were talking about, um, in, in their panel, all distinguished journalists, they were talking about, you know, the revelation that Kevin McCarthy and McConnell had, you know, you know privately said, oh, Trump's got to go. This is, this is terrible. This is horrendous. And then they backed up when they got pressure from, from their base and, and their members. But in doing that conversation, they they made it, they kind of normalized it. They treated Trump almost like he was a President Eisenhower who was going to run again. It was like it was regular politics. And so we as an audience and we as journalists, we have to be more careful about that this is not normal politics, that we have a real illiberal reactionary challenge right now. And one of the great pieces of, you know, journalism, but done by a historian, was, was Tim Snyder's piece, the Yale historian. Right after the insurrection, he wrote a brilliant magazine article for the New York Times, where he talked about, you have people who are loyal to the system, and that's normal, right? That's when you had the liberals and conservatives and everybody's loyal, and you don't have to worry about elections. Yeah, you may play with gerrymandering, and right, but it's minor. It's not like what we're seeing. And then he said, now we've got people who are semi-loyal, like McConnell. When he did the stuff about the Supreme Court nomination, Merrick Garland, he, he monkeyed with the system. That was not kosher. That was not what you're supposed to do. The Constitution doesn't, you're not supposed to do that. He broke norms when he did that. And the, these people who are, it's not to call them gamers, I call them semi-loyal. Sometimes they, they try to appear like we're, we're, you know, we're not the really bad people, but they keep doing things that empower the people who are the breakers, as Snyder called them. So Bannon would be a breaker. Trump's a breaker. Eastman's a breaker. Those people are disloyal to the system. And so back to my point about journalists need to use terms. They should, we should not dignify people with the word conservative. If I had one thing to leave people with, is do not call people conservative who do not deserve the label, right? Um, George Orwell and um, Jonathan Swift both taught us that words need to be used with precision. They're very powerful. What the Republicans are today, not necessarily all the people in the population, but the elite level, how they behave, is not conservative. And certainly a lot of that base is not conservative. And so we should use a different label. We should call them a liberal reactionary or extreme. I mean, extreme works when you're talking about people that believe in QAnon, that breaks through everything. It's like, how can you say these people are normal? You want people like this to run the government? How are they going to do that? You know, they can't think straight. They believe in fantasies. Mm -hmm. And so that would be one of my messages is we need to change how we talk about politics to communicate to others who don't quite see the threat, right? That this threat is real and 
authoritarianism creeps up on you. My last point on this, something I thought about recently was democracy sometimes is amorphous. It's a little hard for people to say, why do we need democracy? It doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Your personal liberty is at stake if you do not have democracy. Liberty depends on a constitutional democracy. If, it, if you elect an autocrat and you let an autocrat take power, all bets are off, right? You don't know what the law is gonna be. You don't know what's gonna be upheld. And especially Tom Paine was famous about this. He said, you could have a good monarch, but I bet you look at the historical record, you're gonna have an awful one and you may have one who is especially savage and you wanna protect yourself from that. So do not go there, right? Democracy is a much safer bet. It's messy, it's hard to do, but it has dignity and it's about us and we get to have a voice and we should protect it. That is, that is a great point to, to leave on. Again, my, my thanks to Kevin C. O'Leary and for folks who, who do wanna get this book, Mother's Day is coming up. Uh, uh, and where can, where can they get it or where can they find you as well? You can find, you can, you can find it online, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the rest of them, Simon & Schuster. Um, and also it's on audio. So it's easy to find online, right? The bookstores are a little tough. The book's been out for a little while, so you can't depend on the bookstores themselves. But you could ask your local bookstore to order it for you or you could ask your local bookstore to put it on the shelf. That'd be great. I do, that, I do that all the time with uh, in, in Terabang books down in, in Dallas. Uh, uh -huh. you, should, you should check them out. They're, they're, uh, they, do, they do noble work for us. <laughs> yeah, good deal. Good deal. Yeah, so it's on, I'm happy the book's on audio now. So because I know many people like to, you know, digest their, their nonfiction reading uh, with, with audio because of podcasts are used to doing listening to you and, mm -hmm. and people like you. So it's, it's, it's in book form and, 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 and audio. Well, again, my thanks to, to Kevin C. O'Leary. And I cannot emphasize enough how much I learned from this book. It is called Madison Sorrow, Today's War on the Founders and America's Liberal Ideal. So again, thank you so much for joining us today on the Text Mix brought to you by Texas Signal. You can find us, uh, Spotify, Apple, Google, I think we're getting ready to, to head up to Amazon and uh, be sure to, to follow Texas Signal. We'll be keeping up, keeping up with the latest. And uh, if you are also interested, we are on Patreon. So you can sign up there on our website at uh, the donate option. So again, thank you all so much and we'll talk thank soon. You. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica.